uh, just um, just incredible um, opportunity. I'm just so glad to be sitting down with you, man. Welcome, my man, Callum McGibbon. How you doing, bud? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. 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 Well, you know, tell me a little bit about that story. I mean, kind of going from this, this rough, you know, rough area, you know, uh, to, to now where you're at and to obviously have that champion, that high, um, high achiever mindset, man, where did that come from? Um, my mom. So, um, my mom's like, I like a superhero, you know, uh, she's the everyday superhero though. She's not, you know, uh, flying around at night, uh, fighting crime or anything, but, uh, my, my mom was just a, uh, like just a beacon of, uh, you know, support and love. And, you know, no matter what the situation was uh, that we were faced with, uh, I can't look back even one time in my childhood and see where I like felt hard done by or felt like I was missing out or that I was like, quote unquote, poor or like anything like, like I, I never had those feelings or thoughts at any time. And I really believe it was just her uh, ability to just look at life, no matter what it handed you as, you know, an opportunity uh, to be better and to be happy. And, you know, she, she just really crafted uh, that character in me um, at like a really young age, like no matter what challenges we had, um, mm -hmm. she built it really. <laughs> That's incredible. And so like, you know, with that, um, what, what, you know, obviously you remember those specific stories where, okay, you, you know, you realize you didn't have much and negative 20 degree, you had a boat, you know, go down there. I mean, that's, that's incredible story. Um, you know, were you ever made fun of it? Was that also, I mean, what, what, what was your driving force? Cause I know your mom was that driving force as well. And was that just always like you're in your nature just because she's been able to like develop that, that right mindset or what did that look like? Um, I think some, I think you develop some definitely you develop resiliency, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because situations aren't, even though like she approached them, uh, like, you, you know, when she would climb underneath the trailer with the torch, right? And like follow the pipes because she had all these treble lights. I don't know if you know what treble lights are. They're like, they used to mm -hmm. use in mechanic shops, like a light bulb and like in it with a cage around it. She had them all hanging underneath the trailer to try to keep it warm under there and like bats of insulation kicked around. And, uh, you know, she would have to follow them up, but like she would come up from underneath there and, you know, I'd be playing or whatever. Right. And she just kind of go right into play. And I, I think as a child, I could see that it was hard, you know, I actually remember one particular time coming into the kitchen and like, just, I don't think she realized I'd got up earlier than normal. And I remember walking into the kitchen and she was just like on her knees in the kitchen and she was bawling, you know, and I was just like, what's wrong? You know, and she's like, Oh, nothing. It's okay. So I, I saw it, right. Like I saw I, I saw this, the struggle. So I, I think I knew intuitively, like that you needed resiliency. Um, but she, she always surrounded me with that, you know, like it's, you can do it. Even though I, I saw resiliency in her, the way she handled situations, I saw the resiliency. Right. And so see, I I, I, yeah. And I appreciate you saying that because it's, it's so interesting. I think, you know, definitely kids, they don't, they don't do what you say, they do what you do, right? And you saw how she obviously corresponded with those circumstances and she kept, just kept pushing for, uh, through. So when when you're you know being raised, okay, what were some distinct you know, areas of, or, or stories of your life that you realized, hey, instead of just cowering like all your other classmates, you just kept pushing through? Was it, when did you really like, when was that deciding point? When did you realize that, wow, I got this, this I'm different? Um. I, I don't know if I ever really did notice it. Um, for, for me, it was just kind of like normal to just kind of, uh, I was always undersized too. So I was always kind of like had to push hard with respect to like playing in the schoolyard and stuff too. Like I always had to try really hard, you know, cause I was so undersized and stuff. So I think, I think it just was just a pro I'm just a product of the environment. I don't know if there was a story I could tell you like that I realized like, Oh, I'm different. Like uh, when I was younger as a kid that, you know, I can push through scenarios or obstacles uh, easier or seem to approach them. Maybe not easier. None of them are easy <laughs> on purpose. Probably. Uh, I mean, I, I just, uh, my viewpoint towards them was different. And I don't know if I noticed as a kid, as an, 
a parent and an adult, I do. I notice it now. I notice looking around and seeing the way people handle stress. Um, like I notice I'm, I have a different skill set. Um, but as a kid, I'm not sure I really saw it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's talk about that then. So now that you're kind of analyzing it, um, what, what are some attributes that you realize, okay, I, I can handle stress or I can develop or I can keep it. What, what does that look like? Cause obviously being an Olympian, right. That, that takes high intense focus and it takes a lot of energy as well as a lot of discipline. And so, you know, that's why I like to get to the root of it's like, now that you kind of sit there and realize, okay, it, you know what it takes to be that high performer. Um, what, what, what do you, what is that there? Um, so just to be clear, so I've been, uh, just to back up on that. So I've, in my professional career, I've, I've worked as a strength conditioning coach in Canada, um, for, you know, 20 years now. So, and, and in that time frame, I've managed to be a strength conditioning coach for, uh, three different Olympians, uh, for Canada, um, that achieved, that achieved gold medals. Um, and, and that's in, uh, like uh, regular Olympics. And I've also been the head of our Special Olympics Canada powerlifting team, a member of the coaching team there um, and achieved, you know, multiple, like, I think 13 gold medals through the powerlifting team in Abu Dhabi in 2019. So, um, uh, so I've been a, a coach in an environment to where you see where you've had to develop people to a point where they're the best in the world at something. And uh I guess what you have to bring every day to be that person, um, you have to bring a, a growth mentality, like every single day, uh, there's, no, there's no way you can't. Um, and you have to bring a level of discipline that's a different level of discipline uh, that most people um, hold themselves accountable to. I, I, so in athletics, um, you know, it, it, I also actually, which is kind of crazy. So after I, I, I met you online, right. I bumped into you and I realized you're like Columbus, Ohio. So what's kind of insane about this whole entire thing is Nick Felino, who used to be the captain of the Columbus blue jackets is my best friend. And he was like my first like real deal, like strength conditioning professional client. And he actually, uh, we're partners on this, is that education platform together? And I'm like, oh my God, you're in Columbus, Ohio. So your listeners are like, awesome. holy geez. So, uh, <laughs> the, um, so, but if I can use Nick as a story, right? Uh, Nick was uh, 16 years old when I, I became a strength conditioning coach. And, you know, he had to give up stuff, right? Like it, it, his dad and I talked about, uh, his dad's Mike Felino is a famous NHL hockey player too. And like his dad and I talked about like, okay, like he's on a different trajectory. We knew he was different. We knew he had the skills to do, you know, to succeed as a high level athlete. Um, so we had to put him in an environment that demanded that of him. So like his workouts were purposely scheduled at 7 a.m. So he couldn't go out with his friends at night, right? He had to go to bed and he was 16 years old, right? Like there's a, you got to, when they say sacrifice, like there's a sacrifice, like that's, mm -hmm. you give up a lot, right. Um, to be able to do what it takes to get there. <laughs> uh, and it's not the workout part. Like, you know, it, you need some genetics. Um, you, you can, everybody can work out, train very hard and be in reach a really fantastic physical state. You need genetics to make it to like an elite level. Um, but it's the sacrifices I feel like around it that you need to be willing to make in order to get, you know, to the top and mm -hmm. how many are willing to do that as a kid, like not drink pop, not eat, you know, high mm -hmm. processed sugar foods, like go to bed on time when your parents ask you to, you get asked out to parties, be like, no, I can't. Cause I have to train. Them or, no, I can't. Cause I got to like how those things around it, all those distractions, right? If you're on that trajectory, they're distractions. If you're not on that trajectory, they're not distractions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And see, that's why I, you know, I really appreciate you saying that because you know, the growth mentality and discipline, I think there's levels of discipline. Uh, many of us are like a beginner or intermediate where, okay, you know what, I, I'm measuring, you know, how much I, I may or how much I make and whatever, or how much I'm, I'm eating or consuming, but there's always that next level, like totally eradicate 
all Coke, all, you know, you know, processed foods, like that's tough. But then, like you said, you have that coach. Now let's talk a little bit about obviously your, your ability, right? You're one of those individuals that not only have been able to develop your, yourself that high level, but you're teaching others, which obviously takes uh, an incredible high skilled individual. Okay. So when you're doing micro little details, right? Cause the micro is, is what makes the difference. That makes the difference between well, a nanosecond, whether, you know, and, and definitely in swimming and, and running and all that stuff, but in the Olympics in general, right? It's that, it's that small thing that makes a difference. So when you're teaching these coaches, the micro aspect of it, um, what do you really dial in and focus in that allow you to say, okay, this is the best return on investment and return on like time, return on energy, return, return on effort. What does that look like? Um, so we're going to just spin to like, um, like the concept of like developing a high performance athlete. Um, it's always started with like an assessment. I was very diligent about understanding exactly where someone is in time right like um i and in an athletic sense you need to understand not just where they are but you need to be able to reach out and kind of compare them to you know a cohort of people in some way uh so i was always very diligent about having a very clear understanding of where they are and very diligent about having a clear understanding of not just where they are physically but where they were mentally um and where they were with their like with their uh, craft. So I, I've done a lot with hockey being in Canada. So where were they at with their craft and how did they approach it? What type of player were they? And I would kind of do this three pronged assessment. Um, and then out of that, you know, generate uh, a direction that we needed to go that brought out the physical attributes I needed that were what that person needed to be the player or the athlete they are. Mm -hmm. And I approach the workouts mentally um, dependent on what characteristics I needed more or less of. So mm -hmm. some athletes, you know, you might put them in an environment where you ask them to do a time trial or something. And, you know, they, when they do it, they already know they, let's say, got a bad time. They don't even have to ask you for the time. They already know they got a bad time and their head goes down and they're depressed and they're upset with themselves. And this is a fraction of like, they finished a drill that's maybe four seconds long and you know, they're walking back towards you and their body language is they've been defeated by themselves. Right. And this is in a time frame of like six and a half seconds, the drills, four seconds and two seconds, you can see they've crumbled. Right. And those athletes you approach in a completely different way. Right. Like I'm not going to approach that athlete with like, you know, come on, like, didn't you find your running shoes today? Like, where's your effort type deal? Right. Like, I'm not going to say that because they've already beat themselves up so much in two seconds right um that that's not how i can coach that person like as opposed to there's some that finish and their body language is like we're walking back and they're looking around and you know they're wondering like you know like they're not really in it and them it's like a total they're they're i'm i'm challenging them i'm challenging their position they've taken mentally on like are you know why did you even show up here like why are you here today and, and so it's really being able to understand all of that and then combining it together and, and, you know, guiding them in a direction that they need to go in, in all aspects. You can't just approach them with like, yeah, you know, we need to be able to squat 500 pounds. Cause if they're not that type of player that needs to squat 500 pounds or why would they need to squat it anyways, uh, then why are you doing it? Right? Like what is the point of what you're doing? So you need to understand everything. So I've been a very diligent assessor my entire career. I'm constantly assessing, um, like my staff, um, I, and, and I, I mean this in the, the most gentlest of way, I kind of, I'm constantly assessing, reflecting on my children, right? Um, you know, where are they now? Where were they a couple of weeks ago? How's their behavior mm -hmm. today? Because I'm, on, I'm always interested in like, you know, uh, is their behavior changing over the next the last two weeks? Oh, well, you know, are you working, are you hanging out with a different friend group at school? Right? Like what's, wh why is, why are you, what's going on? Are you not getting along with your teacher? Did you get a bad grade? Like I'm assessing them by looking at what's going on. And I've always been very diligent about that, you know, and tracking it. I've always been diligent about tracking it and then showing them the trend back. This is where we were. This is where we are now. You know, and, and that, so I really appreciate 
Yeah, and I love it because I'm, I'm just taking notes, man, of what you're saying. And what I love about what you're saying, because see, I think this is so important because I meet a lot of people that, oh, you know, how many hours are you working? Oh, I'm working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And a lot of people are working, right? That's that's not the big thing, right? My audience, they, they got work ethic. But what I always love in, in talking to like someone like yourself, where do you put that work? What's the best return on investment and in having that custom plan that's able to, and not just physical, but also like life, spiritual, whatever, right? Having that custom plan yeah. that says, hey, you know what? Uh, but obviously you you focus on the, the physical attribute, but it's it's very, very, it's a good a analogy, if you will. And that's why I think it's really awesome to having that custom plan because each person is different. And as well as the men mentality, some people, all of a sudden you slap them with the head, they go up, they go out and cry like, oh man, I'm, you know, and mentally they're not there, right? And maybe sometimes you need to come in and be a, just a best friend and say, hey, you got this right whatever and uplifting uh and that's that's awesome now let's talk a little bit about like metrics because you know i'm a big believer in metrics as well i was not a born raised metric kind of person i hate actually metrics but i do know if you don't measure something you're not growing in that avenue so in your life like obviously you've you've done very well in your business we'll talk about that here shortly in that story which is awesome but like what have you dialed in with measuring and metrics and you know did was it were you were you always like that or is that something that had to grow on you um, I, if, so, uh, I got into the training industry and, um, it was a very like 20, uh, well, those daughters. So like 20 years ago now. Right. And it was very influenced at that time by like bodybuilding or body fitness, whatever you want to call it. Um, which is an entirely un unbelievable craft. Like it's an amazing sport. Um, but I was kind of, and I, and so I saw that influence and I was working with this gentleman named Ian Walling at the time. And uh, your honest can check him out. He was Mr. All Natural of the Universe in 1998 uh, to date myself. So I was working with him. <laughs> and uh, so I, I became a trainer with him. And, um, you know, I, he had a big group of clients at that time. Um, obviously, he just won Mr. Universe. So lots of people want to work out with him. And they were people from all walks of life, right? And uh, they would kind of come in and, you know, he would put them through these routines that he knew worked. And, but they didn't fit their environment, right? Like it would be like adjudicator or something, right? Or a lawyer or like a, a guy that was the GM of a car dealership. And I was like, like they're here because they, he was such an authority, right? Like such an authority. And so they were there because they trusted him and they admired this physique he had, but it, it didn't totally fit where they needed. It wasn't, they weren't going to master their environment living his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And there was other people that were working out at the gym. I was, I started working out at the time. Mark McCoy is a 200 meter Olympic gold medalist for Canada. And another guy, Joey Peacock, who was uh, the raw powerlifting uh, record holder for the 198 pound weight class. And I watched Mark McCoy do these plyometrics in the parking lot and the sprint work. And I, I watched Joey do this powerlifting and I'm watching Ian do his bodybuilding. And I was like, holy geez, like these guys all, the way they influence their bodies have such crazy different looks. And I think if I just was to take some of the, the things that each one of them are doing in their discipline and mix it together and bring it over here to this general population woman who's adjudicator for the city of Toronto, I think I could get the result a result that masters her environment, right? She's got to be able to play with her kids. She's got to be able to run, jump, skip. Uh, she's got to have a certain look she wants, but she's got to be strong, right? She wants to be able to do things. She's 52 years old. She wants to be able to do stuff. She doesn't want to be limited if she's got to put a lawnmower in the back of her car and take it somewhere and get it fixed, right? She wants to, that's the life she wants. And so those, that's how I got addicted to metrics. And because I was, I, I had to understand each discipline and I didn't understand the discipline until I started to understand the numbers. And when I started diving into the numbers, then I started getting addicted to the metrics of it all, right? Like what does an Olympian need to be able to run a hundred meter dash in? What does a 52 year old woman need to be able to run a hundred meter, meter dash in? What's realistic? Uh, what's a good expectation? And that's when I started getting addicted to the numbers was because I wanted to bring an accurate plan to people. I wanted to bring them something that they could uh, win at because uh, like being like, um, so I love this. I love health and fitness. So I love talking about, I love talking about business too, but I love health and fitness because it's not uh, being the best at, at anything at all, really. Right. Like it's, unless you're an athlete, it's, it's really about like falling in love with something you'll do for the rest of your life. 
<laughs> and uh, so it was like, and doing, you fall in love with stuff that you accomplish and you win at. You know, if you get defeated all the time, you'll, why you, you're, you're not going to want to do it anymore. It's got to be, it's got to be realistic. So I got in, I obsessed with the metrics because I wanted to give people things they could achieve because then we would be able to celebrate them. And when we celebrate, we have fun, right? And if we're having fun, then we're going to keep doing it. And that was how the cycle started, right? And now with technology today and like everything, like data is everything to me, like in every company, it's like it, everything's, everything's got KPIs, everything's measured everywhere. Um, but that's how I, that, how I got into it, right? Was really uh, organically, I guess would be the word, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's, it's cool because obviously, like you said, you realize that it was, it was a need, right? In your, in your, in your industry, you needed to understand it to have those disciplines to be able to obviously better service your clients, which now you're able to do incredible results. And so now let's talk a little bit about like, you know, what you said, your passion, right? Because I think this is what's so interesting in, in what you're doing with your, 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 your company reperformance. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about like, how did you get into that? You know, why, What's the why behind it, man? What's that story, bud? Uh, well, it goes back to like how I got it. Like how he became a trainer is kind of like the crazy part. So backing up from when I met Ian, how I met Ian was uh, about six months before I met Ian, I was working for a, uh, a company called Tenebec in Toronto, Ontario, and they would retrofit sewage and water treatment plants. And I was working at this uh sewage treatment plant um it was called uh it was right at the bottom of queens I'll, I'll remember the name in a minute so uh anyways working there and i'm on this raft and with a guy he's putting pipe together and i hear this like ah! you know so i turn my head and at the end of the tank we were written on we were at the grit tanks where like all the fresh sewage and flow comes from homes and sewers and all that stuff right at the end of the grit tanks there's a big room there and uh there's this monorail, this crane that comes out over top and this bucket comes down into the tanks and grabs all the sediment off the bottom and takes it back in and then dumps it in these bins, right? So here this blah. So I run in the room and uh, sure enough, a guy fell um, off of this machine he was working on. He fell about 30 feet on the concrete floor. He landed on his head. And I went in and there's blood everywhere. And um, he was choking. I thought he was choking. So I reached in and I tried to pull his mouth open and he kind of gasped because he was blue and uh, I didn't know what to do. So turns out he passed away. Uh, I didn't know him, but he still passed away. And I lasted like two weeks and I went into my boss and said, like, you got to lay me off, man. Like I, I, I just, this isn't for me. Like I just, I couldn't deal with, I couldn't deal with it. So my idea <laughs> was that I would become a first aid and CPR instructor. And I would buy these vans and I would go to construction sites and I would teach construction workers on construction sites. So I became first aid and CPR certified. And while I was doing that, because it was like always at four o'clock, it was after people would finish work, right? The classes would run. So through the day, I would go to the gym and work out because my mom always influenced me with fitness because we grew up with nothing. So I couldn't play sports or I couldn't do anything. We lived in a trailer park. There was no basketball courts. There was no nothing. So my mom just influenced me with exercise. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just kind of work out, right? So through the day, I would go to the gym. That's how I met Ian. And Ian said, you want to be a trainer? And I said, well, what's that? And he said, uh, well, I help people exercise. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like, what do I need to do it? And he said, well, you need first aid and CPR. <laughs> and that's how I got into the industry of actually training. Nice. Um, and then from there, it just kind of exploded because I was where I was supposed to be in life. Um, and it just kept growing and books became like, you know, fruit. I like just, I just engulfed them. Any book or course, anything I could take, I took. Um, I quickly fell in love with the idea of learning more about it, got addicted to it. Um, and then it just kind of exploded, uh, you know, to the point where I was running the strength conditioning program at Laurentian University, University in Sudbury, Ontario, uh, for a decade. Um, had like 220 athletes, eight sports, physiotherapists, run a whole team, um, then got involved with the Olympic programs uh, and training NHL athletes. And it just kind of exploded. And then from there, uh, Nick and I were just kind of, so at Nick's house in Sudbury in the summertime, 
we work out in this thing called a sport court. Uh, and it, it's like a, a drainage court. We can shoot pucks and we pull weights out and lift weights and shoot pucks at the same time in order to mimic different scenarios in a game, right? Nice. And the yeah. kids all pull their, he has three children and they, they all pull their chairs and stuff to the kitchen windows up, up top on the second floor in the morning and they watch us. And I got four kids, he's got three kids. And, you know, we were just like, man, like, isn't it awesome? These kids are growing up in this environment. Like they're just surrounded with this like exercise lifestyle, healthy mentality. And uh, just that started conversations about like, how can we just do more? Like, how can we make sure that every kid uh, at least has that experience? And then, so we ended up thinking about where you originally, where's the first touch point for a lot of children with respect to like their physical health, right? And it's phys ed. So we thought, okay, well, what can we do in the phys ed world? What can we give the phys ed teachers? That's a tool that would allow them to individualize the phys ed experience for students on the fitness side of things, not the sports side of things, right? Um, this triple goal sport rotation is still there. We're going to learn sports. It's great. Um, but truth be told, like not too many of us actually continue playing sports past high school. So how are those skills going to be skills that keep you healthy? Uh, so that was, that's how it kind of started. And I ended up in a tech company. I didn't even own a cell phone like, until like 2012. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. Oh my gosh. And see, you know, and, and I think that's just so interesting how it just, you know, organically developed, right? It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be out there and I'm going to change the world. No, it was just like, oh, this is awesome. I like this feeling. Hey, why don't we do this around everywhere? Right. And all of a sudden it developed and, you know, you know, obviously you're scaling that business. It's been in three countries here. What is, what is the, what's the biggest result that you've seen so far? And, and what's, what's the most rewarding experience? Uh, you know, just let, let's, let's talk about that. Um, I guess, well, for one is there's two sides of rewarding with, with respect to what, what's happening right now. One side is to see, a, to get an email from a teacher, if it's a teacher to say like, Hey, like I like, I've been able to take all the time that I was like, stressed out about trying to figure out what to do with 30 different kids at 30 different physical levels and like how to come up with a plan. And I can now invest all of that thought, time, energy, compassion for these kids in them because your software took care of it all. That's a big win from the teacher side. From the student side, it would be when like we do weekly uh, scorecard for the company and we measure like a crazy amount of metrics. And our goal is to maintain uh, like an 88% participation rate week over week. And, you know, we maintain anywhere between like 92 and 95% participation uh, from the student participating in their exercise plans. And what's unbelievable about that is during Christmas break and, and summer break and March breaks, those numbers don't generally drop very much. Mm -hmm. So the student, so a win for me is that like, we've obviously created the habit in a massive amount of kids to be actively involved in taking care of their own physical health, like making sure it's a priority for themselves. So that gets me pretty emotional actually, <laughs> um, but that's like a huge, huge win, you know, cause yeah. I, I know, you know, and I know like when you feel good, like you're able to focus all your love and attention on other people. Mm -hmm. And you're not really equipped to do that when you don't feel good, right? And that's just part of your, that's just part of, you know, the yeah. natural body chemistry, right? If you're not in homostasis, your body has to look after itself, right? Your thought process has to be internal. Like, how can you give to other people if you're, you're not healthy, if you're not there, right? So yeah. to know that that habit's been created is pretty big. So now we got to go around the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that... You know, let's let's just pause there for a second because I love the passion behind it. I mean, it got you so emotionally involved because it is so passionate, yeah, right? And you've seen it. And you know, where where did that come from? Was that just like you know, was that just as you got into it more, you just started like, oh my gosh, it just flooded you with like, wow, this can be huge because it just started with a spark and then you just exploded. Or what did that look like? Uh, I think I get emotional because so many people have uh, believed in me. So when it starts to go right, like, I just feel overjoyed because it's like a way to show them back how much, like, I care about the fact that they believe in me, right? 
Wow. So I think that part really gets me like that gets me really emotional. Uh, cause I just had some, just like I said earlier, right. Like you're like, you've done some great things in your career. And like the first words out of my mouth were right. Like you're a reflection of the people around you. Like I, I just had some just wicked believers in me, you know? And, and I think it's my, my wife is so incredible at like, um, letting me know it's okay to be vulnerable. I think I was afraid of that for years, you know, to be like vulnerable. Uh, I didn't understand it and I like kind of run away from it and now I kind of embrace it. And when you do like it, it kind of feels fantastic. <laughs> why, why, why did you feel like you, you were running away from it? What do you think? Uh, I think I was scared of like maybe I, I was misunderstanding mm -hmm. the feelings of the feelings I would get would be like an anxiety or a sense of like, I was going to fail, right? Like a feeling of failure. And I was misunderstanding those feelings. I was misrepresent. I was misrepresenting them. Right. Mm -hmm. they, that's not what they were. Right. They were feelings of like, just a, a, a gratefulness for other people um, believing. Mm -hmm. in me. And when I would hold them back, I would be like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fail. I'm just going to keep pushing. Right. And yeah. I think I just had a, a, I misunderstood it early on. So, and I think a lot of that had to do with, you know, just uh, the aspect of my childhood with like when my mom and dad got divorced, you know, I don't think that was like, mm -hmm. a really, it wasn't really like a good thing. So mm -hmm. I think some what, were created there. Yeah. What, what point did you, did you realize that, okay, I, I, it's okay to be vulnerable and you started opening up and being vulnerable at what point? Um, I'd really say it's like just been the coaching power of uh, my wife. Oh, nice. Like, you know, she's just been, because, uh, you know, being in the health industry too, I think I always had to be like on and happy and, like perfect all the time right like because I, I needed to emanate that so people could like grab onto that energy and and take some with them so I think I would kind of come home and she would see like the other side sometimes right like the down the drain like the just how can I kind of keep doing it um yeah. and I would fight like showing it because I didn't understand it was okay to just feel that way I never wanted to feel like not happy, right? Like, or I never wanted to feel like I was beat up or drained, but I was like, ah, oh, no, I'm not, right? So I think my wife just is just a, the most incredible partner. She, she was able to like, you know, coach me along and, and support me and, and letting me know over time and being patient with me because my career is so demanding um, and being patient with me enough to kind of like get me to understand it for sure. You know, and, and I just respect you a, a lot because you're, you're being vulnerable and, and answering. And that's just really awesome. And, you know, let's, let's be coming because it, it leads into the next subject of because being vulnerable, you have the ability to be open with these students and, you know, be passionate and really share that relational aspect uh, with these kids. And, you know, we know that kids are staying in more, you know, COVID and everything like that. And, and then obviously people are in front of, you know, um, you know, they're just fat, right? <laughs> let's, let's just call it they're obese and whatever. And so let's, <laughs> let's talk about like, you know, what is that journey? Do you feel like with your, your company and what you're doing? Yeah. You're, you're attracting those that are already phys ed and already kind of active, but will it kind of flood over? And is that your goal? What, what does that look like for, for you? Yeah. I mean, the reason uh, I, I, we went towards phys ed is because it's, it's mandatory in the education yeah. system. Right. So I'm always like such a, like, you know, someone puts a goal here. Right. And I move it like, I don't move it here. I move it like there, you know? Um, so I was like, yeah, let's do this thing. And I'm like, okay, well let's do physical education because every kid on the planet is going to take phys ed. So if we actually want to make a change to this mm -hmm. world, we want to equip people with this knowledge. We got to go into education, which is like the hardest place to go. Those of you that are entrepreneurs on the, that are listening, like battle, um, but it, we got to go there because every kid's there and, and there we, we, 
we've removed all uh, demographical barriers, right? Like, why why should one child not have access to it because they can't afford it? Like with education, we can get to everybody, and um, so that that's a huge. That was like okay, we, we have to go education because there we're gonna touch we're gonna touch every kid, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone we're gonna get, and and you know it, it, I don't know how much percentage of them we're gonna equip with these skills, but I mean if we look at it from the top down, I think the corporate wellness industry is basically dealing with the problems that we didn't equip people with in education with respect to phys ed, right? Mm -hmm. And not the wellness industry, thank God for it, right? Because workplaces really do put in things to improve the health and well-being of their, of their staff. But I'm looking at it like, well, what's the, where's the source? The source is when you're in grade five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, mm -hmm. that's the source. Like go there, fix it there. Like put everything in right there to make them physically successful for life, not to disrupt the corporate wellness industry. It'll just shift in something else. It, you know, once we make it around, like, like it'll shift, it'll go into something else, but you, there's the, that's the source right there. They're all there, all the kids, right? No matter what, no matter where they come from, trailer parks, doesn't matter. Like they're all there. So let's just go straight there. So it's, and that's, I think it's so awesome because like you said, you're not putting a Band-Aid as a solution. You are going directly to the source and finding what's what's really what's happening. Well, it's just not developing those habits and developing the right the right uh, the priorities, right? Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see. So, you know, with that with that kind of trajectory, first of all, because obviously you, you're, it's, it's blowing up. But I did know, you know, like you said, it wasn't easy at the beginning there. And, you know, obviously that's where that resilience comes in. That's where that tenacity comes in. Right. So let's just talk a little bit about that and kind of that journey, because now you're seeing the fruits of your labor, which is awesome. But let's just share the audience like, you know, that well, the, the sucky parts of it. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, business is uh, not uh, a joy ride, <laughs> you know, um, I, and I don't know whether uh, uh, enough. Yeah, I think a lot of entrepreneurs explain it well. Elon Musk described it one time I heard. He says, you know, well, it's like getting up every day and I'm, I hope I quote him right, uh, staring into a black hole, eating glass. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, there's definitely days where it feels like, like, but you have to eat the glass, but you don't have a choice. You got to eat it. Uh, and you have no idea where you're going and, or, and, and how you're going to get to an outcome. So uh, I, there's, there's so much struggles. Uh, there's struggles with respect to, um, like, I guess, the, your team, like making sure that the people around you are like, you know, strong enough to take on the tasks, like, and understand that you always have to do, like provide more value than you're charging for. And that's just the, that's just the rule of the game, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not producing more value than you're charging for, then you're not going to, you're not going to get there. And right. your team has to understand that that's part of it, right? You can't ever have any, any, um, what would be the right word? Uh, not a regret, but you can't uh, hold anything Reserve. against the customer ever for feeling like you didn't get what you deserve because they're, mm -hmm. you always have to give them more than what they ask for. Always, mm -hmm. like always. And so I think holding your team together and like making sure that they understand that um, and that they can, they can put that out in, every, in everything they do, you know, whether they're in customer support or they're developers writing code or they're, you know, um, you know a, a trainer working at the gym, uh, like they all have to get into that mindset of doing more. And that's a tricky place uh, to go to with a team. And it's a tricky place to hold a team. You know, because it's easy when things go wrong, when you put all your time in and, you, and you've done something and then you launch it or you, know, you write something for a client and they come in and, and it failed. It's really hard to not have a grudge against them and be like, man, I put everything into this. And you're telling me like, it's not good enough. Like you didn't like it, like it failed or it broke like software when you push a feature and like, you're like, you check it in the dev environment for bugs and then you're like, yeah, it's good. And then you put it in production and people use it completely different ways than you anticipated and it breaks. <laughs> right. And then everyone's frustrated and they're like, oh my God. But you know, uh, that's just, 
it's just it. You got to just dig in and be like, oh, it's okay. Like no one did anything wrong. Like it's okay. Right. Like you support the customer, you know, we're going to, we'll fix it. We'll get to the bottom. Thanks for letting us know. Like, but it's keeping the team aware of like, I guess that vulnerability piece again, right? Like it's okay to make mistakes and don't hold it against anyone. It's just learning. You know, learning is your currency in business. The faster you learn, the faster you'll succeed. You just have to, and you can't learn without making decisions and without trying. You got to, you can't be scared to like, we're going to do that. And if it doesn't work, boom, you switch. Yeah. But you can't be afraid to, to go. Yeah. And having that right expectation. And that's why, you know, uh, and I'd like to ask another question here, but like, like what you said at the beginning, growth mentality, right? Always having that when you come into something and say, Hey, I don't know everything and I just want to grow and I want to learn. And guess what? There's going to be a coach or going to be life or going to be, you know, circumstance or a customer that's going to slap you upside the head. That's okay. You can sit there and cry about it over there, or you can say, Hey, what did I learn from it? And make sure that ne that never happens again. Like you said, building that, that dream team. But like you said, I mean, how many times did you have to go through someone to find a, a good operations manager? It may take you a while, but that's okay okay, doesn't mean that doesn't work. It just means that you just got to find the right person that will work, right? And now let's talk a little bit about, you know, because when you're dealing with the government, right, you know, public schools and stuff and getting into that, 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 that kind of category, what was your strategy? Was it, you know, um, uh, you know private schools and, and, and that kind of, uh, you know, industry before you got into the public? Or did you just go after both of those, you know, all three of those strategies there? Um, because I know government, you know, contract, man, that could take years sometimes. So that's why I was just, yeah. what was that strategy look like? Honestly, our strategy was like, uh, like straight out to the phys ed teacher themselves. Like, oh, right. we just went, we reached, we went right to them. Um, we had, you know, we had, uh, so we'd hired a, a consultant that was in the education industry before and talked to us about, you know, there's a lot of, it's, it's quite fragmented from like the, I guess in the States, like the state level to the school or in, in Canada or in, we're in Sweden um, and the UK, like from, you know, the board level to the school level, sometimes there's, it's kind of fragmented, like the board will implement something and the teachers are like, ah, they're putting more work on us, whatever, right? So if you try to go to the board and sell it down, some you won't get adoption because the teachers can sometimes look at it as like more work because the board's telling them to do it. So our strategy early on was like just foot soldiers, man. Like we just like email call, just get a hold of phys ed teachers and be like, hey, you know, like, how are you? What's going on? What are you struggling with? Uh, so we went direct to the, to the, the end customer. Um, mm -hmm. And we went wow, at a price awesome. point that would fit within the, uh, like within their discretionary budget. So, uh, you know, we, we, we did some research on what, what that price point would be that would allow a phys ed teacher to kind of pull the trigger on something without having to go to up the procurement process. Um, so th that's what oh, wow. we did. And we just kind of created, and we had something that they enjoyed, right? So that's another, your product has to work. In the beginning, it didn't work. Like the product was terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. Uh, but, you know, we... we like quickly, you know, okay, what, what's wrong? Like, you know, oh, you know, it doesn't work. Oh my God. Right. And I would approach like, oh, it doesn't work. What happened? What broke? Right. And like, I would be like, okay, well that's a drag. And I, the, I try to approach the teacher from a standpoint of like, you know, I was, I'm always compassionate towards their, their position. So like, oh God, I'm sorry. That's a drag. Like what happened? And then try to find some humor in whatever happened. Right. Um, bring some humor to the situation and then, you know, okay, well, what do you think it should do? You know, mm -hmm. like, what do you think it should do? And they would tell you, right? Like people will tell you, like they'll, they'll give you yeah. feedback on, on what you're doing. Well, let's, so let's, like, yeah. let's talk about that. What, yeah. What have you found that like, obviously you, cause you, you develop and you dial and you listen to your customers. So what have you found like your, the phys ed teacher needs right now to really optimize that, that performance uh, in, in that kind of atmosphere and um, how does your, your product, you know, you know, fit that solution, if you will. So the one the one piece that uh, seems to be a common thread is like a like an understanding of the effectiveness of phys ed on on the student's health. So there isn't really a way to track and understand that over time. So what I mean by that is, you know, it, in uh, grade nine mathematics, you know, we're doing a certain strand of math before we'd move to algebra or whatever right and there's a historical track record of quizzes and things like that that basically allow the teacher to know you know what level you're at and to be able to put the next 
thing that we need to learn in math in front of you, right? Or reading, writing, science, whatever. Um, and if his ed is not really there, right? Like, because they don't really, and this goes back to my intuitiveness of assessing, right? Like, there isn't really like a strong understanding, I think, of how an assessment is important, uh, especially in physical activity, because assessment and physical activity uh, is not about passing or failing right away. It's, it's about getting an understanding of where a student, because we're not talking about a pass or failure. We're talking about like developing healthy habits for life. We can't be, I, I personally don't believe we should be failing someone. If one person does 20 pushups and one person does four, I don't care. Oh. Right? Like it doesn't matter. What is there? Well, yeah. Wow. What is there? Wow. What is there? And where are they in four weeks? If one person wow. did 20 pushups in four weeks from now and one person did four, Right. If one person did four push-ups in four weeks from now and they did an, and they did four in four weeks, okay, what am I doing? What am I not providing to them for them to be able to start to you know find a way to enjoy moving? Maybe we should do more dodgeball or things that develop their upper body because they like those things. And then I can show them that by playing dodgeball and they did push-ups again, that they did more push-ups because it developed their shoulder strength. Like that's hmm. that's giving them putting things in front, but you can't do that without like having a system to assess the students, right? Mm -hmm. And to and to deliver that assessment information back to them. So then they can even bring it home, right? Now you can get the yeah. parents involved, right? Like I'm involved and I'm sure you're involved like in your children, like I'm involved in all their subjects, right? Like I know Jav, our son has a, a science uh, quiz on Friday, tomorrow, right? I knew that on Monday. So I can kind of guide them, right? I can be like, hey, did you yeah. study like, in school? Like, have you prepared, right? And phys ed, I don't really have those that attachment to the class as the parent. I'm not, I'm not in it with them. Whereas if there was an assessment process that was digital that they could show me on their laptop or their iPad or their cell phone, I can be like, geez, at the beginning of phys ed, you were here and now you're here. Like your beep test has gone from 3.2 to 4.6. Like, what have you been doing in phys ed? And they're like, oh, man, we've been playing like dodgeball and we've been going for jogs. And like, well, I'll go for a jog with you. You want to go for a jog? Now I'm involved, right? Like as yeah. the parent. I can support the process, but we need to connect. We need to connect it all. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the phys ed teacher hasn't had a tool and a way to do that. So they've kind of been left and we, and we look at phys ed and we're like, oh, where's technology fit in? Right. We're going to be, we're going to be physical. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Um, so they're late, they're late adopters too. Right. Like they're late to the yeah. party. All the other subjects have got technology. <laughs> phys ed's got late to the party. Right. Like look at me. Right. I right. 2012. So I, I, cause of my whole life, I've just been physical. What I need that for, I'll just run over yeah. my neighbor's house and talk to him. So uh, I think they're, they're late, right? Yeah. So now yeah. they're, they're at the party, right? And they're like, oh, wow. If we can use this in a really positive way to create mm -hmm. these habits and changes, right? Um, and, and then, so I, I think that's the, uh, the piece. Yeah. Well, I think it's so interesting because you, you said so much and I'm getting excited just from obviously hearing you because you're exactly right. You have Fred over here that maybe does zero on the first day, but four weeks he's done 10. Well, that trajectory has grown for himself. That's amazing. But this guy over here, day one, he did 20 and then he increased by 25 after four weeks. But guess what? Maybe you need to, you know, what's going on there. And then as well as I love what your, your strategy is because it's, it's almost like this, you know, wax on wax off kind of thing, right? You know, yeah, hey, waxing off. I don't know karate. And then all of a sudden, oh, I can do 10 push-ups, 15. How did you do that? Well, because you put yourself in these environments, right? And, and you know, being able to, you know, do dodgeball, things that they enjoy. And all of a sudden it builds that muscle. They don't even know it. They're having fun. And then obviously now, now it's, it's part of the journey, right? Now they don't think of working out and physical activity as, oh, it's a task. I got to go to the gym. It's more of, oh, it's part of my lifestyle. If I just integrate that with my lifestyle, which I think is just really awesome. And, uh, you know, what you're seeing is those metrics on a consistent basis, man, that's, that's very exciting news. And let me ask you, like, have you had, and I, maybe, maybe you don't have metrics on this, but I'm just curious with, with people that are obese, right? Um, you know, obviously that, that's, you know, something that's always going to happen definitely with processed foods. I think people are becoming more aware of that and more obedient with that and disciplined with it. Uh, but what have you noticed with your trajectory and with implementing your system? Uh, have, do you guys keep measures and, and metrics of that? We don't. Uh, well, yes, we do keep metrics on, on weight and height, but it's difficult in those groups because, you know, they're, they're in peak height velocity, right? A lot of them are transferring through it or approaching it or coming out the other side of it. So they're growing and shifting so much. So rather than tracking those metric metrics, we don't track those. Um, 
with a, as much maybe authority or as we do um, the other metrics, which we, we track through the software, which is that globally right now in the software, um, students are improving in upper body um, competency, right? So like just, we can say like, uh, like I, I hesitate to use the word strength because it's, it's not necessarily strength, but like maybe they're doing more reps or whatever, right? But across the database right now, um, across three countries, students are improving by an upper front uh, by 3.3% per week that are using the platform right now. And upper back, so we categorize it into upper front. So that's like, you know, anything that's on the front of your body that's like, a, you know, yeah. from the body of the cage up. So all exercises that the AI generates there for that area right and then upper back is kind of the same thing right from the bottom of your ribs uh you know to the top of your neck here and the back of your arm so any exercises that are back there and then lower body exercises and core and conditioning so we have it into these four categories that we just monitor and we're getting you know most of the categories we're getting three percent to you know two percent uh per week of improvement now taking into consideration uh there our group is our group right now that we focus on is basically from grades like five to grades 12. Um, so when you expose children to exercise, they, they excel at a much more rapid rate than we do as mature human beings, right? So those numbers are, are, are high um, because of the demographic, right? But we're still recording it and we're still seeing it. Um, so I think that's the biggest impact I've seen so far is like, we're actually changing the physical health of these kids. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, that's, that's a big metric. <laughs> that's that's big huge. Metric. That's yeah. huge. That's awesome. Very exciting yeah. stuff, man. So, Hey, tell me like, where can they, where can my audience reach out to you? And, you know, maybe there are some of these people are, are parents or students or, you know, obviously individuals that are listening or phys ed individuals and they want to implement this into their school. How can they reach out to you, man? The best way is just to go through uh, our website. So it's uh, www.repperformanceapp.com. Uh, it's rep performance, all one word, only one P. Uh, and, you know, or like they could find me on LinkedIn. So uh, I don't do tons of social media, but I do do, uh, I do have a LinkedIn profile and I do do that. So they could just find Cal and give it on LinkedIn and you reach out to me through there. I certainly don't mind and love to talk to people, but you know, that like, like you, right. I just, I love this topic. That's, why we're we aligned today, right? Like we both love this topic. So it's, it's easy to get together and talk about it. So people want to shoot the breeze about it. I'm, I'm game. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. I got lots of value. I got lots of value, you know? Oh yeah. Oh game. yeah. You do, man. <laughs> I love it. And so guys, those, uh, those links will actually be in the description below. So make sure you click on that. Make sure you reach out to them, make sure you communicate with them. And then before we let you go, man, first of all, I really appreciate just the value that, that you're bringing into our audience, but also the value that you're bringing into the, into the industry. Uh, you're exactly right. Building these, 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 these habits, uh, so consistent and the love for, for, you know, activity and stuff like that, the impact that you're having. I'm very excited. And we just really appreciate you being on. Uh, however, though, before we let you go, is there any last words of wisdom you want to share with our audience? Um, I, I, someone asked me not, not that long ago, I think it was about a month ago. Somebody asked me like, uh, you know, if you could just give some people like one thing, right? Like what's the one thing. And for me, I'm always like so inclusive minded. Like I want to give people something that uh, doesn't require them to go out and buy things or whatever, right? Like go to a gym, whatever, like just one thing that they can do uh, to, you know, I, I, that's going to empower them in their life. So uh, I really thought about it before I answered and I realized, I think the one thing that I would stress to your audience to do, if I could give them something to take away as a tip that I know improves your life, get up one hour earlier than you normally do and spend that hour with yourself. Like, not a phone, not a TV, not a radio, not anything. Because inside that hour, whatever you should be doing is going to come, you know, and it's not anything that I could ever tell you, right? Like you, something's going to come forward, whether it's like, I need to be like more, I need to spend more time with my kids or, you know, it could be things that scare you, but learn from me. It's okay to be scared, right? It's totally fine. Um, or it could be things like, I got to start, like, I got to stop smoking or I, I got to, I, I got to start jogging or I got to go for a walk. 
but something's going to come in that silence that is just what you're supposed to do because your mm-hmm. brain and your soul knows it but we just it's so busy right throughout the day and it just you get distracted and so if i was going to give your audience something to take away that's my tip like do that get up and just be in yourself and whatever comes you know you got to act on it whether it's hard or easy or scared or scary or exciting you got to do it you know and that my friends is Callum McGiven. Guys, thank you so much for joining Journey with Christian Devin's uh, podcast. Until next time.